But Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage of Scripture, and we're going to come back to our text at the conclusion of our services. But verse 20 says this. The Apostle Paul writing, he says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Amen. How's that for a contradiction? Amen? That's good stuff right there. I love when the liberals say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. There's one right there. How are things that are invisible clearly seen? Well, ex Paul explains it in the next, verse, in the next phrase. He says, being understood by the things that are made. Yep. Paul says, if we want to understand things that are not seen, then we need to understand that what we do see yes. reflects those things we don't see. And Paul says, there are two things you can see in creation that are part of God. He says, even his eternal power and Godhead. How many of you are going to look at Mount Baldy and say that was just a random chance? Yeah. You know, you, you look over a Lake Tahoe or something like that, or you get up on a, you know, a Palos Verdes over there, and you look over the ocean, and you say, man, random chance. It's amazing how that worked, huh? No, no. His Godhead and his eternal power are seen in what we see today. Amen. And then I want you to look at verse 21. Paul dovetails off of verse 20 and says these two words. Because of that, comma, when they knew God, everyone say the, Nick, the, the two words knew God, knew God. Now that's important that you say that because in the last part of verse 20, the two words are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Now, I'm going to use the word vile affections today. Understand that I didn't say that. Paul did under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which was me. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. <clears throat> I don't want anybody to walk out of this room and say that the Bible isn't clear. Okay? Uh, I think the Bible is pretty clear. All right? I don't think we need a clearer translation. I just think you need to believe what you read. Amen? Amen. See, the homosexual agenda seems to be everywhere these days. Media music, and magazines are all about how cool and accepting it is to, quote, come out of the closet. Yeah. <clears throat> While sodomites have come out of the closet, Bible-believing Christians have stayed in the closet. Yeah. Many Christians, and I borrow that phrase there from Brother Mark Kirkpatrick, many Christians have been cowered into silence by the sodomite agenda by calling Christians who express their biblical views as, quote, homophobic, bigoted, intolerant, and those are just the nice words. The sodomites call their lifestyle an alternative one. I call it a death style. For the inevitable end of this vile behavior is by and large 
a premature death. What the sodomites want isn't tolerance. What they want is all-out acceptance without restrictions. They want the ability to practice their sexual deviancy with no criticism or pushback at all, whether from the government, the state, the local, or an individual neighbor who sits on their porch. Since no sodomite, by definition, reproduces, all they can do is recruit. And they desire to have free access to your children in such a way that if you open your mouth to say anything against them or their agenda, you will automatically go to jail for a hate crime and it's happening as we speak. Now, here's the question. How does the traditional, that would be us, Bible-believing Christian, that would be us, respond to the sodomite agenda within this created environment, and it's been created, of open season against traditional Bible-believing Christians. Amen. This morning, the title of our sermon is a relevant one, entitled, The Homosexual Question. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look at your word, and we pray, Father, that folks would walk out of here with some clarity on this issue. Lord, we have been bombarded with media, with music, with all the things that this world has to offer to somehow force the acceptance of this lifestyle down our, th down our throat, Lord. And Father, we don't necessarily need to accept. And Father, I pray this morning you'd help us to see some clarity from your word in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Before I get into the, uh, the, the, the crux of this message this morning, I want to give you some words of clarity. These are some of the things we talked about a little bit a couple of Wednesdays ago. But there is a whole lot of misinformation regarding homosexuality that is bandied about in Christian circles. Now listen, I am an equal opportunity basher. Amen? Uh, I'll bash our own guys as well as I will the, the guys on the other side of the spectrum. And, and I want to make sure that the, the information that proceeds from this pulpit is accurate information. Uh, listen, I don't agree with the homosexual agenda. Uh, I, I have homosexuals in my family. I love them, but I don't agree with anything that they do. Uh, but the fact is, uh, there's a lot of misinformation regarding homosexuality that is bandied about in Christian circles that it would behoove you and I to get the facts and nothing but the facts. And the first thing is this. Sodomites and sodomy should not be considered a special class of sin or sinner. That's right. That is extremely important because they are sinners just like any other sinner. And what tends to happen sometimes within our circles, especially the more aggressive uh, evangelical circles, is they'll say uh, there's, there's adultery, there's drunkenness, there's fornication, and then there is in this black, bold homosexuality. Paul doesn't put it like that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Keep your finger in Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. Again, for those of you that were here on Wednesday nights, just bear with me. Verse 9, the rest of them weren't here, so they get it, amen? Verse 9, know ye not, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, everyone look up here, the word effeminate not only means sodomite, but it means lesbian, it means transgender, it means everything that you can think of today. The word effeminate is all encompassing. Our modern translations will just say homosexual, that's just one group. Effeminate covers the whole spectrum, including uh, Bruce Jenner. <laughs> Let's move on. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Ten. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Look up here. I don't see the word effeminate, nor the phrase abusers of themselves with mankind in black bold. Do you? No. I see those sins in the same line with fornicators and idolaters. My point is this. If Paul, through the Holy Spirit of God, did not consider this a special class of sin or sinner, then neither should you. You see, Paul puts them right in there with the rest of them. Verse 11, 
And such were some of you. Amen. Talking to the church at Corinth. And he says, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. So the first thing you need to know in terms of clarity is sodomites and sodomy should not be considered a special class of sin or sinner. They are sinners, just like you're a sinner. Yeah. Number two, sodomy is not the unpardonable sin that many within Christian circles seem to suggest it might be. Some people think that if you, go, uh, you cross that particular line, uh, that somehow you can't get back across it. And they have their verses for it, and we're going to look at them in just a minute. But listen, sodomites can receive Christ as Savior just as a drunkard or an adulterer can. Now, you say, what's my proof? Paul just said in 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. That's past tense. Someone say amen. amen. That means they engaged in that activity. They were part of that community. They were part of that sin lifestyle. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, they've been saved, they've been redeemed, and they have been bought with a price. Amen. So it's not the unpardonable sin. You say, well, then where do they get it? Go back to Romans 1. Verse number 28. Now, let me just make a, a caveat here. Usually the extreme Calvinist position will be the position I'm about to give you. Okay? More moderate Calvinists wouldn't necessarily hold to this. Some of them might. But the extreme guys would say this in verse 28 of Romans 1. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And they center their entire doctrine on the fact that a homosexual cannot get saved once they cross that line. They center their entire doctrine on the word reprobate. In verse 28. Now, we have some men in here, uh, and some men that uh, aren't here, that have some uh, idea of the, the legal system. And we all know what probation is. Some of you in this room might have actually been on it at one point in your life. But probation is a time of testing. Can we agree with that? Yeah. It's a time of testing. We're going to see if you're going to be true uh, to, the, uh, to the dictates of what we say you ought to be true to. And if you don't, then we're going to reprobate you. We're going to put you back under. In other words, it has to start all over again. Or you're going to have to go back to prison, and then the probation starts over again. The word reprobate doesn't mean without any possibility of ever getting saved. It just means that you get put under probation again. You get tested again. I don't know of a person in this room who's never been reprobated. Every one of you have been tested and flunked. And then got reprobated. That's right, that's right. Think about the Old Testament Israelites in the wilderness wanderings for 40 years. Every three days they got reprobated. <laughs> they would fail a test. God says, you flunked. They get reprobated. So it doesn't mean without the possibility of getting saved. And it doesn't mean that if you're homosexual, that you, once you cross that, quote, moral line, you can't get back into it. That's silly. That is silly. First of all, what you're doing is you're walking on the blood of my Savior. You're saying that the blood of the Savior cannot cleanse certain sins. And let me tell you something. It can cleanse any sin. Amen. Any sin. Number three, sodomites can, like drunkards and chronic adulterers, go through their entire Christian life fighting this sinful desire. Now, this is something that some of our groups don't like to really acknowledge. But let me just tell you something. I have seen men and women get saved by the power of God and quit whatever their problems were cold turkey without any notion of looking back. Right. It's amazing, but I've seen it. Yeah. Some people that were drunkards, man, they don't desire it anymore. But then there are some, they get saved, they, don't even, they can't even be around the smell of it because it brings them back to the urge. Right. Can we agree with that? Uh, there, there are some people that maybe they were chronic adulterers. They were fornicators before they got married. And, and there are certain things that just tip them off. Even though they're saved, they've got the Holy Spirit of God. Some things, they look at it, it tips them off, and it gets them back into their behavior. And folks, all I'm saying to you is, sodomites can, like drunkards and chronic adulterers, go through their entire Christian life fighting this sinful desire, but it doesn't mean they're unsaved. It just means they know what's right and they know what's wrong. Now, what about some of the liberal logic concerning Christ and the God is love thing? Because this is usually what happens, right? You'll get, a, you'll get an unbiased talk show host. You'll get an, let me say that again. We'll get an unbiased talk show host who doesn't have a dog in either fight. 
right? And, and, and sits there as a moderator because, you know, that person is just balanced and fair and all that kind of stuff. And, and they'll have a, a, a homosexual supporter over here. Then they'll have some, you know, Christian that's had said some stupid things over here. And then they'll have them debate. And then the homosexual guy will say, or the defender of the homosexual rights will say, you know what, God is love. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got news for you. My dad is love, but he hurt me a lot. <laughs> Listen, what about that liberal logic concerning Christ? And the common liberal canard goes something like this. Well, Jesus Christ never spoke directly about homosexuality, so therefore it should be a non-issue for Christians. As if that's the fait accompli statement. Like I'm supposed to go, oh, thank you, you've said it, now I can't say anything against that. Oh my gosh, that is such, the, lo the logic is so good. You know what I think the problem with some of our folks is today? I don't think they understand what critical thinking is. You see, critical thinking is to, by definition, is to critique and to be critical of what somebody is saying. I would hope that you would apply that with all of my messages. Because why? Be a Berean, right? right amen. Search the scriptures for yourself. Don't just stand up and say, oh, the preacher said so. Well, what does the Bible say? Amen? amen? Well, so this is what I would say to that canard of, well, Jesus Christ never spoke directly about homosexuality, so therefore it should be a non-issue for Christians. Here's my reply. Number one, the assumption of the liberal is that Jesus Christ only spoke that which is recorded in the four Gospels. Right. It's like whatever Matthew through John say... That's it. Yeah. Furthermore, because the liberal does not believe that Christ is both God and man, they do not take into account that he is the ultimate author of the Bible. Amen. Beginning at Genesis 1.1 and concluding with Revelation 22 verse 21. Right. Now because he is the ultimate author of the scriptures, he is well aware of what Leviticus 18 verse 22 says where it says this, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Amen. Because Jesus Christ is the author of the entirety of the scripture, and he authored everything between Genesis 1-1 and Revelation 22, verse 21, he would also be well aware of Le Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 13, which says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood should be upon them. I am sure they would understand that he'd be aware of those verses. Yeah, amen. But they probably don't. So their logic is already a little flawed because they're not giving Christ the benefit of the doubt of being the author of the entirety of Scripture. Number two, here's my second reply to the old liberal canard. Christ came to fulfill the law, amen. not to destroy it. That's right. You say, how do I know that? Matthew 5, 17. He said it just like I just said it. Matthew 5, 17, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, I came not to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law and to die for folks who couldn't keep the law. Amen. I added that last part. <laughs> now, if Christ came to fulfill the law, which Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 is definitely the law, it would imply that he is com in complete agreement with the law. Amen. Let me say that again. For some of you that... Don't think as quickly on your feet. <laughs> Tim, I'm straightening it out. There we go. All right, now. <laughs> if he said he didn't come to destroy it, but he came to fulfill it, then that means he's in complete agreement with it. That's right. And if that's the case, then the logic starts to fall apart. That's right. Number three. While Jesus Christ never spoke directly against homosexuality in the Gospels, he also never spoke out for it. Isn't that funny? They'll say things like this. Well, Jesus Christ never spoke directly against homosexuality. And we're supposed to be going like this. Oh my goodness, how can I respond to that? Oh man, I, I got to go to college to respond to that. And then, and then you, got, you just simply say, well, it might be true that he never spoke directly against it. But he also spoke, he didn't speak directly for it either. But you see, we're not supposed to have logic. They're supposed to have it. Number four, we must be careful not to compartmentalize Scripture and draw false distinctions between that which Christ said in the Gospels to that which some other part of the Bible says. Now, here's what the liberals will do. They'll quote Jesus as if he's the be-all, end-all, and the Gospels are it. The Bible is only Matthew through John. It's not Genesis through Malachi, and it's definitely not Acts through Revelation. 
we have a problem with Paul's statements, you know. Uh, you're going to quote Revel, uh, Romans 1, and we have some problems with Paul. And you can't go over to Leviticus 18 because we have problems with the law. Why? Because you have problems with the author of the book? You see, we must be careful because 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable Amen. for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Right. All of it, from Genesis 1.1 to Revelation 22, verse number 21, it is all inspired equally, not some more, not some less, all of it is equally inspired. But the problem is today we want to compartmentalize things. And we want to say, well, what Jesus said carries more weight. No, no. See, Jesus is not going to say anything that contradicts what is already written. Jesus is going to say, well, you've heard it said that it wasn't good to lie with man as you lie with women. But I'm here to say that it's okay. He didn't say that. He didn't say that anywhere. In fact... When he had the opportunity to say something that would at least imply some sort of uh, acceptance of a lifestyle that was an alternative one. In Matthew 19, he says, when God created man, he created a male and female at the beginning. Amen. Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 2, and that is found in Matthew chapter 19 where the Lord talks to the Pharisees about this. Now, with all that said, <laughs> let's jump into this. Go, go to Romans 1. We're going to take about 15 minutes here and, and give you some good information, hopefully. Romans chapter 1, and I want you to look at verses 20 and 25. How can the homosexual agenda be accepted in the community at large? Now, it's true that for the last 30 years, they've tried to make us laugh our way into accepting them. Can we agree with that? Yeah. I think we all remember the show Soap. Yeah. Billy, Crystal. Billy Crystal played a gay character. That's in 1970s, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I think you all remember Three's Company. I understand that John Ritter was playing a homosexual, but it doesn't matter. The whole point is we're still laughing at it, right? Uh, and then, of course, you had uh, Will and Grace in the 90s and early 2000s. And now, of course, there's a show for everything, the L word and this and that. Okay, and, and we're supposed to not only laugh at it, but now they put touching stories and we're supposed to connect with them because there's, you know, so solemn music and stuff and our heart cries and stuff. Well, that's the way the media tries to change our hearts. But that by itself is not going to help. So here is the way that the homosexual agenda is going to gain worldwide acceptance. And it's found in Romans 1, 20 through 25. I'm going to tell you, sodomy is accepted with a complete redefining of God. A complete redefining of God. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So the first thing we have to do is to take away the fingerprints of God from creation. I think we all know where I'm going there. Oh, yeah. we, first thing we've got to do is take God's fingerprints off the mountains, the oceans, the lakes, and the Grand Canyon, and all of the wonderful things that we see in this world. Yeah. We've got to somehow take his fingerprints off it and say that it was not God, but a process known as evolution. And then in verse number 21, it says, because that when they, everyone say those two words again, New. knew God, stop here. They all know. I don't care who you are. I don't care how hardcore atheist you are. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. There is no way that sodomy can be accepted wholesale by the public unless they can somehow get, get God's stamp of approval on their behavior. And the way that this is being done is to redefine the God of the Bible with all his thou shalt nots and to reduce him to nothing more than a mere created being. Which is what they're going to end up with in verse 25. 
So the first step in doing this is we have got to take away the fingerprints of God from creation and make people think by and large that this is all random chance. You are a pointless individual. You have no reason to be here. When you die, you just die. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no intermediate state. There's no karma. There's none of that stuff. There's just death. The second step is don't give God glory and stop being thankful for anything he does. That's in verse 21. When they knew God, you see, the, the, the phrase knew God implies that they know that God deserves two things. To be gloried and to receive thanksgiving. Amen. Those are two very basic Bible principles you'll see Everywhere in the Bible. Amen. And when you fail to give him glory like Nebuchadnezzar did. That's right, yeah, my kingdom. That's right. All right. You're going to eat like an animal for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 what, what's his name over there in the book of Acts, you know? Uh, my kingdom. So the worms ate him. That's right. You know, I, listen. You fail to give God glory and you don't be thankful for his benefits. We got problems. You can talk all you want about other doctrines in the Bible. Those are two fundamental things that you had better recognize God for. Amen. And they know it. And they say, you know what we'll do? Here's how we'll start the redefinition. Number one, we'll take his fingerprints off of creation. Number two, we just won't glorify him and we won't thank him. That's right. For anything. What do we do at Independence Day? Thank God for our country. What do they say? God had nothing to do with this. Yeah. We thank God for our founding fathers, by and large, who are a bunch of white, straight, Protestant men. Amen. And they'll say, well, they didn't believe in God. And they're all slave, they were all slave owners anyway. Third thing. Make yourself the standard, not the Bible. Verse 22. Professing themselves to be, they become fools. See, the general rule of the Bible is that if you are wise toward God, then you're a fool to this world. Isn't that right? If you're wise towards God, then you're a fool to this world. But on the other hand, if you're wise in the world, then you're a fool in God's sight. That's what 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19 says. And what they need to do is, number one, take God's fingerprints off creation. Number two... They have got to make sure that we don't give God glory and thankful because those are two basic things that he deserves. And number three, we need to make ourself the standard and take away this. Amen. And so what we'll do is we'll set up people in higher education to contribute to a no, whole new generation yeah. that will just produce and recruit yeah. more of us. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then the fourth step is this. Make the willful choice. I'm going to stress it again. Make the willful choice. I'm going to say it again because you're going to be taught something different. Make the willful choice to yield to vile affections. Now look at verse number 23 and following. They changed the what? Uh-huh. How did they do that? Well, in verse 21, the first thing they did is they didn't give him any. That's the first thing they did. They didn't give him any. They didn't thank him for anything. So now they changed it, the glory of God, into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now look up here. Voltaire was an infidel who's probably in hell today. He was a French philosopher, but he said something that was true because even a busted clock is right twice. Here it goes. He says, God created man in his image, and then man returned the favor. Now listen, all I got to say is this. He's probably in hell right now, but that's about as smart as it gets. <laughs> God created man in his own image, and then man 
return the favor. You see, the, the sodomite movement cannot have gain, they cannot have the acceptance that they want unless they can redefine God and get him to stamp his approval on their behavior. But the only way they can do that is to take the standard away, take his fingerprints from creation away, make themselves the standard, not the book, and then once all that happens, they end up changing his glory into nothing more than a created being. And then he concludes in verse 25, they've changed the truth of God into a lie and they worship nothing more essentially and serve the creature more than the creator. What do they do? They made a God of their own choosing. They devolved him down. And they say, well, this, the book says, you know, thou shalt not, but the, the God that we serve at the Metropolitan Church, it's different. And then lastly, they make the willful choice to yield a vile affections. I want you to look at verses 26 and 27, and you'll have to underline a word here because it's important for you to know this because the culture is going to teach you the exact opposite. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Look up here. Now, this is important because here's what happens sometimes. If you want to do something bad enough and God sends you reproof after reproof after reproof that you shouldn't, at some point God says, have at it. And by the way, that's when it's scary. Because with that have at it comes a sense of liberation on your part. And that liberation, you don't realize it, but it comes with stocks and it comes with bonds. And I'm not talking about money. Verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use in that which is against nature. Now I want you to notice the word change. Verse 26, change. In order to change something, you have to, you have to change something. You have to make your mind up and change. Now look at verse 27. And likewise also the men leaving, underline leaving, that's an act of the will. That is an act of the will. Leaving. The natural use of the woman burn in their lust one toward another, men with men. Choice. Excuse me. Um, change. Excuse me, verse 26. And leaving. Are all acts of your free will. God did not make you gay any more than he made you a bank robber or an adulterer. So don't blame him for your problems. God did not, does not, and will not authorize or approve of your sin no matter what sin it is. Now, what's the next step? Here's the next step. It doesn't stop because th th this still doesn't gain acceptance yet. This is just making Christians angry. So now the next step is to try to stamp out all knowledge of the biblical God from your thinking. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So here's their goal. Once they've redefined him and taken him out of creation, changed the standard to, their, to themselves instead of the book, once they've redefined God, once they've done all these things, guess what? We're going to try to stamp out all knowledge from our thinking. We don't like to retain. The word retain means to keep knowledge of him. And then the final step is, and this is the unfortunate reality of it all, God turns you over to the fruit of your decisions. Look at verse number 28. And even, the, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, the word convenient there, uh, it's a, I, I would have chosen a different word if I were a translator. However, but um, it, it's a heavier word than you and I would think it is. And then verses 29, 30, 31 tell you all about the fruit of that decision. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetous, backbiters, verse 30, haters of God, despiteful, disobedient, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You mean that characterizes that decision? Yeah. That's what God says. Not me. That's what God says. That kind of, where God says, you know what, I'm letting go of the reins. 
I'm not going to pull back anymore. I'm not going to send the Holy Spirit of God to convict you. I'm not going to send preachers and missionaries. I'm done with you. If that's what you want to do, I'm done. That's right. You have been reprobated. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God. Oh, man. Look up here. No matter how much you try to stamp out the knowledge, you know. He says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now you say, well, wait a minute. That's, that's harsh, preacher. That's harsh. Now, uh, this next thing is going to get me in trouble via YouTube, but I'm going to say it anyway. In Leviticus 20, it said that the, the sodomites were worthy of death. Let me tell you why God said that. And some of you are going to have a tough time accepting this because, you know, you're like the liberal over here. God's love. He says if you don't, what will happen is this disease will spread and then you'll die. You say, why? Because, you see, straight people are the victims of this kind of behavior. You say, what do you mean by that? Oh, come on. Let's just think about this. Sexually transmitted diseases? Yeah. There's one in particular that's really big. Oh, yeah. He says if you don't get rid of this, it'll become a scourge yeah. on everything. Now listen, I'm not saying we go around and kill everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying that was God's heart when he wrote that. Yeah. Now, with that said, let me conclude with this five-minute thought. How should Christians respond towards sodomites? I got to start, I got to end like this because the other stuff is too heavy for you. The first way you ought to respond is number one, like sinners who need a savior. Like sinners who need a savior. They're no different from any other sinner. Amen. They've just chosen a path that is really rancorous yes. and is in your face. And guess what? You're going to have to treat them like sinners who need a savior. And you've got to witness to them if they give you an opportunity. Number two, here's how you respond to them. Secondly, with truth, not political emotion. Amen. You have got to do your best, my little Tea Party folks in here, to divorce your political emotion when dealing with people like this. You say, why? Because political emotion doesn't win the battle. The Lord and his word wins the battle. Amen. Okay? So... You, you do it with truth, not political emotion. By the way, and don't give them cheap truth. Give them exactly what is stated. Don't paraphrase. Don't try to somehow massage the God, of God's word. Give them what it says. Amen. Let them know this is what happens when you choose this. With truth, not political emotion. Number three, and here's the, here's the money shot. With tolerance but not acceptance. You see, I'm looking at some of the most tolerant people on the face of the earth right now. Because every one of you believes that this, I'm assuming, let me, let me rephrase that, I'm assuming, every one of you believe this book is inspired of God, Amen. and I'm assuming that you believe that God is in control and is the authority. Amen. And because he, and I believe that you believe that the Christian Bible is the truth. Amen. And I believe that you believe that our church preaches the truth. Amen. But at the same time, we tolerate yeah. people and their religious beliefs all over the city. That's right. Whether it be a Jewish synagogue, or whether it be a Muslim mosque, or whether it be a Buddhist temple, or a Sikh temple, or whatever it might be. I disagree wholeheartedly with their religious belief. I want to see them one to Christ, but I tolerate them to worship. Amen. I have no problem with it. I got no problem with the JWs knocking on my door. I agree, disagree with everything they say, practically everything, 99.9% .9 of it. But listen, if they got the freedom to knock on some man's door, I got the freedom to knock on man's some door. If the Mor Mormons can come to my door, you know, with their little Elder John sticker here and, and say, you know what, I want you to be a part of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And I say, why don't you just call it Mormonism because that's what it is. I says, I, got no, I, got, I disagree with them totally. But guess what? They have the freedom in my country to do that. I'm so sick 
of these little stupid coexist. Uh, I coexist. I have been, Christians have been coexisting with other non-believers in this country for 200 plus years without no problem. We don't take Christians and separate them from Muslims on a ship and then throw the Christians overboard. We don't do that. We wouldn't do that with Muslims. If there are a bunch of Christians on a ship and there are Muslims there, we want to make sure everybody was on the ship. Their soul is important. Their ideology is bunk, but their soul is important. Christians are the only ones that can truly tolerate. Amen. We're the only ones. So what do they want to do now? See, it is possible for me, as a Bible-believing fundamental Baptist, it is possible for me, as a Christian, to love somebody, but not love what they do or be in agreement with the choices they make. It is absolutely possible for me to do that. And I have done it time and time again. And not just with this current subject. And what they're saying is, no, 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 that's not tolerance. You've redefined it. No, we're giving you the definition of tolerance. See, they redefine God, and then they redefine tolerance. And they say, no, no, tolerance means complete out-and-out out acceptance of without questions of what we're doing. No, that's not tolerance. That's manipulation. That's right. Now here's what I say to you. The homosexual lifestyle is not, I'll say it again, is not an alternative one. It is a death style. Amen. And according to Romans chapter 1, they will receive in themselves, catch the wording of the verse, in themselves the recompense of their error. Yeah. In other words, they'll get payback for it. And folks, I'm telling you right now, you're going to meet some that are politically motivated and just are over the top. And then you're going to meet some that are just sweetest people on the face of the earth. And I've met both. I remember when I was working with my dad years ago and we used to do a lot of... Uh, props and stuff like that for Hollywood. Uh, we used to go to Paramount Studios. Listen, 50% of those people down there were, were homosexuals. I was friendly with every one of them. I had no problem with them. They, they weren't doing anything to me or saying anything to me that was I mean, whatever they were doing in private. I don't know what they were doing in private, but in front of me, they were just fine. So I treated them like a human. They treated me like a human. And they got wind that I was a Christian, and then they got wind that I was in Bible college. And guess what? they kind of thought it was weird that I was nice to them. See, we're not saying that you need to breathe fire on them and say, you're a homosexual, ah! you know, and burn them like into crispy critters. No, no. You need to love them, but don't accept what they're doing. You stay strong.